the average uh, person, Cena, doesn't have an, any understanding of what electric fencing did to the possibility of pastured livestock. To the farm, it was equivalent to indoor plumbing in the city. We know what indoor plumbing did to the city. You know, you, you could take a bath. You 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 didn't have to go to the outhouse. Um, you know, you could you could wash things down. You could clean. You could wash clothes more frequently. I mean, all sorts of things happened with with electrification and indoor plumbing. Okay, that that simply that simply were not possible. You know, before then. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Labels. I'm Dr. Cena McCullough, and I'm here with our favorite farmer, Joel Salatin. Hi, Joel. Hi, Cena. <laughs> you always sound so excited when you say that, Joel. <laughs> Hi, Cena. <laughs> As you can I, tell, am, Joel. I, am, I, I am excited. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Cena. Is that better? <laughs> As you can tell, Joel and I have already been having lively discussions this morning. You know, we start between around 7.30, 8 in the morning and no caffeine at all. And we're, you know, perky little birds. So today's topic is very exciting for me. Joel, our great um, agricultural historian, is going to walk us through the history of how concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs came about. All right, take it away, Joel. Yeah. So as everybody knows, you know, the concentrated animal feeding operation, whether it's a feedlot for, for beef cattle, a, um, a, a, a huge, you know, 10,000 cow um, confinement dairy or a Tyson chicken house or a Smithfield hog factory or a, um, you know, a Purdue turkey house. Um, and these these massive laying houses um, for eggs, you know, we, we're here, but how did we get here? And I think it's important to understand, again, uh, we're not conspiracy theorists here. We think, we think that people um, are generally well-intentioned, the things that they want to do, they're generally well-intentioned, but somehow they get off the rails and they're solving, they're, they're trying to solve problems that they realistically want to solve. And they cause more problems. So let's understand that in let's go back to 19, let's just go back to 1900, let's say. 1900, there were several things as, as industrialism started, cities started, uh, you know, uh, farms needed to be bigger to supply these, you know, to, to supply the, the, in, the increasing size of the cities. But farmers did not have uh, very critical things to be able to scale up. So the animals are outside, um, you know the 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 average the average uh, chicken flock size. I mean, think about this. In in 1940, the average chicken flock size was only a hundred hens. Okay, oh. why why was that the case? All right, uh, and and in the in the 1930s and 40s, there was rampant hog cholera. It was a deadly disease that ran through um, every everything. It, it was it was awful uh decimated the hog industry why did hogs have cholera why did chickens get merricks and newcastle's diseases and all these things all right because as it was because as farmers scaled up markets were growing uh you know farmers were trying to 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 get you know additional scale in their production i want you to understand there was no there were three things that needed to happen in order for farmers to scale up with animals on pasture or, 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 you know, outside one was they needed control. They couldn't have these animals running all over the place. Well, there was no electric fence. There was no electric fence. So fence had to be physical, physical. So you're talking about, about, you know, physical wire, uh, physical boards, lumber. Well, you know, there was no, that was extremely expensive physical, Physical barriers for animals are extremely expensive. You you can't just put a bunch of you know a board fence out through a especially when there's no chainsaws. Um, you know lumber is very expensive. Steel is very very expensive, and so there was no fencing. So you couldn't you couldn't scale your chicken or pig or or cow operation very well. 
um, because all you, all, all you could afford for control was boundaries. You didn't have internal control because it was too expensive to control. Number two, they didn't have um, plastic water pipe. Plastic water pipe, you know, if, if you're going to scale up and you're going to have animals outside, you need to be able to get them water. You need to be able to, to control them and move them around on fresh ground and you're able to get them water. Well, they didn't have any water pipe. So guess where all the animals went to drink? They went to creeks. They went to rivers. They went They went to, you know, people did build a few ponds, but basically all the water was in a central location. And so the animals muddied all this up. They pooped in it. They peed in it. They, 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 there wasn't a good way to get the water into a sanitary place and protect the water inventories that they had. So the creeks ran with all sorts of, you know, uh, bacteria and, and, and problems. And then the wait, third thing was- wait, can I ask you a question on that one before you go to the third? So there's no plastic water piping. Did they not have like metal pipe? That yeah, but it was very, very expensive. Okay. Very, very expensive. So so it, 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 um, it put it out of the reach of the average farmer or, okay. or certainly- um, or, or certainly to be able to run it, run it, you know, to the far ends of the farm to, you know, to, to, um, to get it to as many spots as you'd want to get it to, to actually work. Okay. Uh, very, very expensive. The third thing was the chainsaw. There was no chainsaw. The chainsaw was not, invented, was not really completed until 1957. That's a really, that's a really um, ex important thing because the chainsaw made biomass, made the carbon economy functional. Until the carbon economy, until the chainsaw, the only carbon available was straw from, from grain. So if you wanted carbon, you had to grow grain to get the stems for straw to, to, to have your carbon. And so... These, so as a farmer, think about it. you're a farmer, you're in 1900, you're a farmer, you're wanting to expand your, your um, let's just say your, your chickens, okay, your chickens. All right, you, 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 so, so you take your 100 bird flock and you turn it into a 1000 bird flock, but you can't control them. They drink out of, a, of a, a, a creek or a spring and they drink in the same place. That becomes all muddy and poop, pooped up and um, and and they completely denude, you know, the vegetation because you can't move them because you can't because there's no fencing, so you can't move them to a clean area. You can't give them water if they were there, and 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 if you even do um, want to try to uh, control them in the winter, um, you can't get enough material down underneath them to absorb all their manure, especially pigs, and so. What you had was a raging time of 1900 to about 1930, a raging time of diseases on the farm, all sorts of diseases on the farm, um, because farmers didn't have these things. Well, thank goodness, along came antibiotics. So antibiotics allowed animals to remain viable even in fairly unhealthy conditions. Then came cheap energy. So the gushers, the oil gushers of the early Texas oil runs, you know, the the, the booming, the 30s, the, the 20s and 30s and 40s, these oil gushers, all right? Suddenly we started getting cheap energy. And with cheap energy came transportation. So you got cheap, cheap energy, cheap fuel, you got antibiotics, you got mechanization, so now suddenly you could move you, you before before mechanization and cheap energy you could not move feedstocks whether it was hay grain or whatever you could not move feedstocks to that many animals in one spot even if even if you could keep them alive you couldn't move that much material in and the manure out you simply couldn't move it in ox carts and and mule driven wagons and hand you know hand forking so it was the mechanization that allowed the concentration uh, to, uh, of the animals to be able to scale 
the mechanization and the cheap fuel allowed uh, allowed you to bring more volume of feedstocks to a certain location and haul the manure out. Okay, so 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 everything before you know, the 1930s and 40s, everything was um, was limited in size and scope due to the inability to transport things in, uh, cheaply, the inability to control things cheaply, the inability to get water cheaply, all right? So you get water control and fuel, and, and you simply could not expand because of those limitations. But once 1940 came along, um, you know, then, then things started to change pretty dramatically. And, and what I'm, what I'm getting at is again, I want everybody to understand there was no, there was no farmer conspiracy that, that we, we want to, we want to lock these animals in a building. No, it was, it was the, the, the antibiotics that enabled scale to move forward and, and outside and the mud, the mud, the lack of being able to get water, farmers were looking for a way out of the mud, out of the disease, out of the weather conditions, you know, uh, you know, ha having half the chickens die in a blizzard. Uh, farmers were looking for, for ways out of all that. And as the, as the fifties came along, as the 1950s came along with, with the cheap fuel, the mechanization, the concentrated animal feeding operation with the antibiotics freed farmers from the mud and the disease that they had been dealing with for the previous 50 to 70 years during early early ag industrialization without these other components now what happened in the like i say 1957 we got the chainsaw then we started getting little four-wheel drive tractors with front-end loaders we finally got real cheap plastic pipe in the you know the late 1950s early 1960s so that so that water could be delivered uh, all over the place and by the early 1960s we started getting electric fence the average the average uh, person cena doesn't have an, any understanding of what electric fencing did to the uh, to the to the possibility of pastured livestock um it, it 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 was it was the i don't know what to uh equivocate it to it, it was it was I mean, to the farm, it was equivalent to indoor plumbing in the city. You know, we know what indoor plumbing did to the city. You know, you, you could take a bath. You 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 didn't have to go to the outhouse. Um, you know, you could you could wash things down. You could clean. You could wash clothes more frequently. I mean, all sorts of things happened with with electrification and indoor plumbing. Okay, that that simply that simply were not possible you know, before then. And that's the way it was on the American farm before you had electric fence, plastic pipe, chainsaw. Now we can, now we can um, control animals. We can move them around. We can get them water. We can get them, we, we can have them outside without mud <laughs> and, and, and we can get them on new ground instead of being on the same ground every day where you have all these pathogens. So we can actually raise them without antibiotics, on clean ground, with water. Those, those components, it literally took, you know, 40 years of technology development to finally bring those components together. But by that, by the time those components became very affordable and 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 you know and, and ubiquitous within the system, the concentrated animal feeding operation had become the model du jour, right? The, the model of the day. And as you and I know, when something becomes orthodox, it permeates, it permeates the science, it permeates the paradigm, it permeates the economy. It, you know, it is just, that's the way we do things, right? 
and, and so uh, uh, supposed supposed efficiencies, supposed economics, supposed uh, uh, protocols, all those things by the you know by the seventies and eighties when these you know when these other components of of control water delivery the carbon economy with chainsaws and chippers when all those things finally became available and and, and affordable to the farm by that time CAFOs had captured not only the orthodoxy but even the imagination of of the nation so much so that even imagining imagining a functional food system without a CAFO became uh, foolish, you know. Who 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 would who would even question it? I mean, it would be like it would be like today um, uh, telling a child, uh, you know, you 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 should never use a toothbrush. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, we just we just do it, right? You know, you don't you don't question that. You, yeah, we use a toothbrush. Um, and, and so that that's that's how. That's how we got to our place, and 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 the problem is, as when orthodoxy, when conventional orthodoxy takes over a a model, um, not only does it not look for alternatives, but it doesn't even recognize alternatives when they're presented. And so, you know, on, on our farm. Um, I'm very quick to tell people, you know, we're trying to present a a credible alternative that anybody that comes and visits can leave here and say, we don't need a CAFO. We, we don't need a CAFO. Um, and that's one reason why we don't we don't get uh, whatever. We don't go down the rabbit holes of, for example, heritage breeds and and trying to raise a pig with you know, with no grain. Uh, I mean, those those are all well and good, and and they push they push the envelope. And I'm glad there are people you know pushing the envelope. I mean, I know there's there's a guy like in Kentucky. He's got 200 acres of woods. He raises, I think it's I think it's 10, 10 pigs a year with no grain. They just run in the woods, but he he sells them for ten thousand dollars a piece. You know, sausage for a hundred bucks a pound. And you know, look, I'm glad that somebody's pushing that envelope, but. That's that's not a credible alter. That's not an alternative that I can present, you know, and make and make a, a logical argument to somebody. We don't need we don't need uh, KFOs, and so we we recognize that we do make some compromises in order to have an authentic, credible alternative to the entire, you know, the entire uh, uh, KFO industry. And of course, I have not even mentioned animal welfare or the social emotional aspects of an animal that that that's crammed into a a small spot um you know breathing their own feces all day eating on their own toilet you know I, i'm not i'm not even uh, um bringing that into the conversation uh but that that is a you know that is a huge part of of this um of of, of the imperative of why we need to create credible alternatives so that the so so that the, the pigness of the pig can be honored the chickenness of the chicken can be honored and 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 I would suggest that a that a culture that doesn't honor and respect and and try try to create a habitat that honors the pigness of the pig and the chickenness of the chick, chicken will um, we'll soon, you know, not honor and respect the Thomas of Tom and the Mariness of Mary. You know, we, we we create an ethical framework on which we hang, you know, everything else. It, it all hangs on that. And so I don't I don't want to discount that, but 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 believe me, nobody nobody set about in the KFO business, nobody sat down and said, let's disrespect animals. N nobody did that. Nobody sat down and said, let's make a let's make a terrible place to raise pigs. Nobody did that. They they were they were trying they were trying to solve their mud and disease and scale problems. They were trying to solve those issues in a time where the cities were expanding, the markets were expanding, and the economics were pushing farmers to expand 
but they literally did not have the tools like electric fencing, plastic pipe, chainsaws for biomass to make carbonaceous diapers. They simply didn't have the tools to be able to scale um, uh, without having all those those negatives. And um, and so the, the the bringing the animals inside seemed to be an answer to weather issues. It seemed to be an answer to mud. It seemed to be an answer to disease. It seemed to be an answer to water and control and and labor. It seemed to be an answer to all those things, um, you know, at the time. And uh, of course, you know, as as we're want to do as humans, right? Okay, we've got some benefit here. Let's let's do it more, more, more. Um, and and suddenly, um, you know, the 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 one room schoolhouse that works very well suddenly becomes three thousand uh, uh, students crammed in an institution. The the city that works very well at a hundred thousand suddenly becomes a million. You know, the the uh, the the little the little uh, house of um you know of 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 2000 chickens that works very well uh suddenly becomes a house of 100,000 chickens you know and, and and so uh we see that you know we talk about patterns a lot on this on this pot we talk about patterns and and this is one of the patterns that that it seems it seems um uh just plagues <laughs> plagues the human mind that um, that that if a little a little is good, then more is better, more is better, more is better. And and we know, especially when it comes to biology, um, uh, that that there are there's a reason why a mouse is the size of a mouse is, and an elephant is the size of an elephant is. Elephant the size of a mouse wouldn't be a very successful mouse, and a mouse the size of an elephant wouldn't be a very successful, you know, element ele ele elephant or a very, whatever. Um, <laughs> The the, the 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 point the point is that there there are there are reasons for biological limits and scale and 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 function and um you know uh, uh just just because an actinomycetes in the soil is such a wonderful microbe um doesn't mean that that um it would be better if it were five times bigger you know the actinomycetes works because it's tiny you know, it's a tiny microbe. And, and so we see those kinds of uh, things. And, and, and so what happened with the CAFO, it was, it was absolutely well-intentioned. They were trying to solve problems of the day. They did, they did a lot of very, very small ones, but then, but then as, as fuel became cheaper, transportation became cheaper. And as, as concrete became cheaper, uh, lumber became cheaper, all these things, uh, and antibiotics became cheaper and more ubiquitous. All of those things enabled a simple housing solution of 1930 to become, you know, um, uh, a, a stadium-sized a stadium chicken house in 2023.